my uh, my childhood was a little rough because I spent time on the farm after we had moved to Phoenix. I would go back and work on my uh, uncle's farms, and I was the city kid, and they were, you know, farm kids, and they treated me like farm kids treat city kids, um, which wasn't always the greatest. My my uncle was actually the worst, Uncle Paul. He he would say things to me like, um, how do you keep a dumb city kid in suspense? And I would go, I don't know how, and he'd say, I'll tell you tomorrow. And <laughs> no. no. Right, yeah, 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 something else. Yeah. He said, how do you keep someone in breathless suspense, a, a, a city kid in breathless suspense? And, he'd, and I'd say, I don't know how. And he'd say, cover your mouth, plug your nose, I'll tell you tomorrow. So, and I fell for it both times, which is sad. Uh, in my defense, I was a dumb city kid. So I didn't know about how to live on a farm. Um, but we live in suspense. We, we live in anticipation um, we we live in a, a, an anticipation of of what will be. Uh, Advent is that time. We're kicking off a series of sermons on Advent, and Advent is really great. Uh, Advent is the time of anticipation, a time of looking forward. Anticipation is difficult for many of us because anticipation calls for us to have hope, to to see a future, to, to want something that's beyond the present. Hope speaks to our deepest longings. Unfulfilled hope can crush us, can crush our spirit. Because hope sees what, uh, beyond what is to what is possible. Um, and so in this time of Advent, we're, we're looking at, at what will be. By the way, Advent is not about Christmas. <laughs> we, you may find that weird because it always comes right before Christmas. Uh, Christmas has already happened. God has kept the promise that he made to Adam and Eve. And uh, when they turned away from him, he sent Jesus into the world. He promised he would do that. And Jesus has come. He's lived the perfect life among us, a life we couldn't live. He offered it to us through his death and resurrection to pay for our sin, to pay for our distance from God, to bring us back uh, to him. That's happened. That's been done. Advent means coming or appearance, what is coming. Jesus has made his appearance, but the really amazing thing is he's coming again. He's coming again. And that's what Advent is about. We know that he's coming again, and, and it's because he says he is. He promises he is. And we know that he's coming again because he kept his promise the first time. And just like all of Israel waited for the Messiah to come, so we get to wait for him to return. And as we do that, um, we're going to look at at the life of Mary today, and we're going to see um, some beautiful things about how she waited, what she did. But we live in this anticipation. There's this, there's this desire. I, you know, kids before Christmas waiting for presents. Um, I like, I like this picture. Uh, right, anticipating bacon. Right, like uh, your your dog <laughs> because dogs are stupid, and they, and you think. <laughs> You think you think farm kids are bad? I mean, city kids are bad. You should see dog. Yeah, cats are awesome, and thank you for that. Um, but but they're just so enthusiastic, you know. Oh, bacon, 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 <laughs> and they pant. And they in that that kind of anticipation, that kind of hope, that kind of that kind of desire, that passion. Where that's not sustainable, right? Um, as soon as you get the bacon, eh, okay, we're done. You know, um, my sister has a help dog, and she carries hot dogs around in her in a little pouch, little bits of hot dog, and 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 the dog will do anything she asks. You know, 
She says, if I had known this years ago, I'd have carried a bag of uh, cookies around and when I was training my kids, you know, like in a little pouch. Here, do this, and then the kid does it. Uh, we, we, they anticipate the dog's always looking to her, not, not because he loves her, the dog doesn't but because she has hot dogs. And so we kind of do that. We have this, this desire, this, this passion, this... Um, by the way, my, my wife says I should never talk about pets because I always get in trouble. So, um, but, and I'm sure I will. Um, I don't care, but I, I will. Um, so, so, there's this, so there's this anticipation, but it's an anticipation that we can't maintain. We're not capable of maintaining this high level of anticipation. Jesus is coming again. Jesus was coming when the angel appears to Mary. Jesus is coming. The Israelites knew that. They've been waiting. Scripture says that Mary is troubled. She's troubled when she hears the angel's greeting. She wonders whether or not it's real. Uh, By the way, people are the same now as they were then. Uh, Encountering spiritual stuff is is strange. When we encounter weird spiritual things, we we tend to wonder about our sanity. The spiritual being approaches us, we, we look for rational answers. We want scientific explanations or alternative answers of, Perhaps Mary's mentally unbalanced. Uh, Perhaps she has a psychological problem, um, maybe a brain tumor, uh, um, a physiological thing. Maybe she just has an overactive imagination. Spiritual encounters are weird, and and they're always weird. They're awkwardly normal and, and very weird at the same time. God comes into his world. He sends angels. I love in Scripture whenever an angel comes, people are terrified, right? They fall flat on their face. Ah! Right? They freak out. Of course they do. Of course they do. Because it doesn't fit. All around us are doubters and scoffers and people who look down on us with pity if we believe. If you want to be cool and hip and awesome uh, and, and not a a city kid, um, then it's probably good to wait uh, for what is possible uh, in this world. It's not good to, 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 to start talking about the impossible. You see, babies aren't born to virgins. People don't rise from the dead. People don't return from the spiritual world thousands of years later, we sit here in anticipation of something that could happen thousands and thousands of years from now that wouldn't happen in our lifetime. The Christian faith is absurd. If it were logical and reasonable and understandable, then everyone would simply accept it as fact. But we don't. Mary's been waiting for the Messiah. It's a crazy promise made by God thousands of years earlier. Matter of fact, in Genesis 3, 15, it talks about how, how God already establishes a promise. He makes a promise to, to the Israelites, to Adam and Eve, that will go through the Israelites and all the way to the present and to the future and to the end of time. This promise that he will crush Satan. And that he will do that through the Messiah. Mary is waiting, but it seems silly to wait. After all, it's much easier to doubt than to believe. It doesn't take any skill to doubt. It doesn't take any talent. It doesn't take any special ability. We live in a world of doubt. I just got an email from some nice lady in Africa who wants me to uh, send my account information, and she promises me she's going to share me $7 million. Think what I'll be able to do with all that money, right? There's something in me that doubts a little bit, maybe. 
No one has heard from God in a long time. There have been hundreds of years between the last prophet in the Old Testament and where Mary is living. But Mary still lives in a world of anticipation, a world of hope. And now suddenly this angel appears to her. The angel tells her she is highly favored and that the Lord is with her. What an amazing statement. The Lord is with you. As we look forward, we can also know that God is with us as we make our journey into trusting that Jesus will return, that the Advent is real. We can know that God is with us. He's not angry with us. He's not seeking to destroy us. He's not ignoring us. He, he's, he's with us. In the day-to-day realities of our lives, he is with us. Suddenly Mary is faced with the reality that she is going to be the mother of the Messiah. It's a mind-boggling proposition. Mary concentrates on the absurdity and settles on the obvious question. How will this be since I'm a virgin? She's troubled. It's hard to understand. And she says, how, how will this be? She asks, how will this be, not how can this be? When we're questioning God, there's a crucial difference between how will this be and how can this be. How will this be and how can this be? How can this be is a, is a doubter's question. How can that be possible? How can I give birth to the Messiah? How can I be the one? How can that? that that's a question of doubt. Mary says, how will this be? Do you hear the faith in that? She assumes it will be. This will be. God says it. It will be. It's going to be true. How will this be? She recognizes that God is all-powerful and can do as he pleases. Psalm 115 verse 3 reminds us that our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. And the amazing thing is that what pleases him is to call us to himself. That's what pleases him. That's what's motivated him. That's why he created us and called us to him and sent his son to die for us. That's, that's why. He does what pleases him. We have questions. Mary has questions. She says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? How will this be? It's It's an inquisitive question. She can't wrap her brains around it, right? I get that. I, I don't understand how it all works. People, people want me to explain faith. And what we're really doing is we're asking, like, give me a rational explanation of why I should believe. Well, duh, it's called faith. You're not going to get a rational explanation. It doesn't make sense, right? If it made sense, and it's rational and it's reasonable and we just do it. But it's not. It becomes rational and reasonable later on, but we begin where Mary begins with how will this be? How will this happen? The angel explains. The, ex- the angel explains and, and Mary accepts the explanation. When you question God, what are your questions like? Are they questions that come from a place of trust? Are they questions that come from a place of hope? Are they questions that come from a place of belief?
Einstein said, question everything. Right? Question everything. Ask a million questions. We, we like that. We have lots of questions. Most of us come to God with a million, billion, trillion, zillion questions. We're like two-year-olds, three-year-olds. Daddy, why that mommy, why that mommy? All day long with the questions. Shut up. Your parents go nuts, right? It just goes, oh, please. Stop with the questions already because we, we just don't have time to answer them all and some of them we don't know the answers to. <laughs> um, why can't I have candy before dinner? I don't know because you're hyper, right? Uh, it's... We have a million questions, and we're like three-year-olds with God. We got a million questions. But do those questions are, are your questions, the questions you have of God, do you go to him and ask them in the simple, profound faith that Mary has? Or do you go with anger and doubt and a little bit of, you're not giving me what I want, and I don't get what life doesn't work the way I thought it was supposed to work, and I, and and there's all this stuff that that you don't do that I think you should do, and 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 why, and we and we become accusatory of God. Mary's not accusatory at all. Not at all. Mary chooses to believe. Mary chooses to believe that God is good, that what he says is true, that the Messiah will come, and now that it's true that she will be the mother of Jesus, the one who will rule over everything for all eternity. She chooses to believe. Belief is always a choice. (laughs) Some of us are kind of waiting for some huge event or some moment when all the lights explode and the music swells and it's awesome and then we go, oh, now I see, now I believe, right? No. We're we're looking for that angelic experience. But Jesus now invites us to simply choose to believe. It's a very simple thing to do. It's a very profound choice that changes everything. If you do it, if you do it, choosing to believe. And when we choose to believe, when we make that choice, then slowly, over a long period of time, the path becomes clear and things make sense. The other thing that Mary does is submit. She says to the angel, well, let it be to me the way that you've said. She simply acknowledges that God is ruler over all, and she submits to him. If there's anything that I see in the culture in which we live, it is our failure to ever be willing to submit to anyone, anywhere, anytime, over anything. We want to go do research on the internet. We want to go make sure. We got to find out for ourselves. We we have this deep and abiding trust in our own intellects and our own minds and our own ability to find out information. It is really hard for us to submit to someone else's authority. We don't like submitting to parental authority. We don't like submitting to government authority. We don't like submitting to authority, period. We don't like it. It's hard. Mary overcomes that natural thing that we all have in us of not wanting to submit. She simply says, okay, let it be. Submission is placing yourself under another. Submission is putting yourself under. As husbands and wives, we're called to submit mutual submission. I I love that. Because I want my wife to submit to me. I want her to do the things that I want done the way I want them done. Like put caps on bottles and screw them tight. Because she puts stuff in a refrigerator and she doesn't screw the lid on tight. And then when I pick things up by the lid, 
they splatter and break, and uh, and it, it's horrible. If she would just submit to my much better way, which is screw the cap on and put it in the refrigerator, then life would be grand, right? But she won't do it. She doesn't think that way. She thinks I should submit to her plan, which is why is anybody ever stupid enough to pick something up by a cap, <laughs> right? So we have this disagreement, and that's how it is. We will not submit. So the choice is, okay... I have to say, fine, I'll stop doing that. And then she has to say, okay, I'll submit, and I'll just turn the cap on. And now I think she still turns the caps on, but I'll never know because I pick things up not by the cap anymore. And she thinks that she submitted, and I think that I've submitted, and we both have submitted. That's how mutual submission works, right? And we're to submit to one another. We're supposed to love each other and care for each other and think about each other and honor each other. But most of all, we're to submit ourselves, put ourselves under God, to put ourselves under Jesus, to put ourselves under the Spirit. And when that happens, we are overwhelmed by the Spirit. The Spirit comes on Mary in power, and she becomes pregnant. The Spirit of God overwhelms her. She is completely enveloped by the God of the universe. In our doubt and in our disbelief and in our fear and in our trouble and in our struggle, we too, as we wait for this next great coming when Jesus comes again, God sends his spirit to overwhelm us, to take away our doubt, to take away our disbelief, to walk with us, to encourage us. Then two interesting things happen. One is she's recognized, right? She goes to see Mary, uh, goes to see Elizabeth, and and she enters Elizabeth's house. Now, Scripture's kind of, we're not sure exactly how they're related, but um, we always say that John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus and that that Elizabeth is is Mary's cousin. That's actually, it just means relative, the word that's used. So somehow they're related. We don't know exactly how. And she goes to visit Elizabeth. Now, there's probably good reason for that. She's pregnant. Um, She's not married. It's a scary time for her. Um, She could be stoned to death for that in the culture in which she lives. Who knows why and what comes before her, you know, why she goes. But she goes to visit Elizabeth and... When she walks in, um, Elizabeth knows who it is. She knows. And John, the Baptist, John, her baby, this old woman who shouldn't be having babies, is six six months pregnant, and, and the baby jumps for joy. Jumps for joy. She's recognized. The baby is recognized. Jesus is recognized. When you recognize Jesus, when you are overwhelmed by his spirit, when you live into that truth, then their joy happens around you. You want a joyous season, Christmas season? Acknowledge who Jesus is. Recognize the Messiah. And Mary is blessed. So blessed that 2,000 years later we mention her name with awe and with a bit of reverence and great joy. We often go the other way, right? We say, God, if you bless me and recognize me and overwhelm me, I'll try to choose to believe and submit to you. Um, But I got a lot of questions. That's not the way of faith. That's the way of reason. The way of faith is is to understand and start with anticipation, to choose to believe, to submit, to be overwhelmed, to be recognized, and then the blessings flow out in your life.
Mary's a great example of how to wait as we wait for Jesus to come again. Are there any questions or thoughts, concerns, pushbacks, ideas, concern, concerns about the whole Rod being abused by the farm kids? Yeah, I just want to apologize for laughing. At that <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm also sorry you don't put this these beliefs into practice in your life because you could have seven million dollars by now. Yeah, there you go. Right. I um, so my question is: I, a lot of the times, God's call in my life feels like that email from Africa, and I mean, sometimes it's wise for us to have doubts. So. Do you have thoughts on discerning or, or how, how how do we, you know, know whether to have doubt or have faith in a specific situation? Yeah, faith and doubt are on a continuum, right? Um, you can't have complete faith without some doubt, and you can't fully doubt if you don't have faith. The opposite of the faith-doubt continuum is apathy, right? We just don't care. We don't engage at all. There's nothing. That's the opposite of faith. The, we always think the opposite of faith is doubt. It's not. It, you're, they're, they're kind of on the same thing, and, and you place yourself somewhere on the continuum. So sometimes in the middle of the night, I have a hard time going, well, what happens if I've just been wasting my entire life on this, and this is stupid, and it doesn't mean anything, and there is no God? And then I think, oh, I'll just go back to sleep, because what else is there? Like, what else is there? What's better? What am I giving up? I have an amazing life because I have a life with God, right? So what other choices would I have that are better? They're not better. Like, I've seen them. You can take an old man's word for it. They're not better. We think they are, and, and sometimes in my youth I thought they were, but they're not. There's no other alternative than this amazing relationship with God the Holy Spirit always comes, puts me back to sleep, and says, you'll be fine. And in the morning, I am. So, yes, when you go through the periods of doubt, and we all do, um, no strive for faith. Take hold of faith. And again, remember, every time it's a simple choice. We say, yeah, but Ron, it's intellectually blah, blah, blah. I don't care. It's still a simple choice. Would you say, because Mary doubts but her response is how will this be rather than like it, it's a it's a doubt but that she strives for hope and questioning how it will happen rather right. than this this isn't going to happen how right. can this happen her assumption is that god is real and that he is going to do what he's going to do and says what he means so Just curious, uh, in the in the Greek, if what what the root word is in that in that context, did you by any chance look up the will and the? In some translations, it does say can. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be literal or anything. Yeah, no, the original word is a word of confidence. It's not the word of, of I, and I know we use the word can, but um, but the. I would just wanted to make. Sure, I just wanted to see if you looked it up. And I like do, oh yes, the, and, and absolutely the best. In case anyone else is looking, there are several <laughs> translations that say "can," but the right. Greek. There are translations that get it wrong, <laughs> um, but no, the it is the the correct idea is that you will, and I think it's important. I think the distinction is huge. Yep, sure. Yep, after all. I guess we're done. Let's uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your provision and care. Thank you that you are coming again, Jesus. It's hard for us when we live in anticipation of that. It's hard for us to maintain our hope. 
in the world around us we see struggle and pain and suffering and in our own lives that's true as well father and and so it's difficult thank you for sending your spirit to overwhelm us to walk with us father invite us to believe to take simple simple steps of trust help us to ask good questions not judgmental questions. Father, you stand as judge over us, not us over you. Help us to look forward with great anticipation to that great day when you come again and make all things new and right. In Jesus' name, amen.